In this video, we'll be doing an overview of photosynthesis. So there are quite a few things you need to know about uh, this topic. You need to know the equation, like what is this chemical reaction? Um, how do the how does the plant actually um, get the reactants needed? What sort of so what sort of adaptations do they have? Uh, and then after that, we got the two reactants. How does the plant actually use? these reactants and then looking at some of the uh, factors that can affect the rate of photosynthesis and then finally using our understanding of that how can we maximize the rate of photosynthesis uh, for farmers for agriculture in greenhouses so these are the few things that we're going to cover in this video so let's start with looking at the equation so first of all this is the word equation for photosynthesis we've got carbon dioxide reacting with water uh, and in the plant cells, it can turn into glucose and oxygen. In particular, you will need to know the symbol uh, or the formula for glucose, which is C6H12O6. If you're doing combined, actually, you will need to just be able to recognize the formula for glucose. If you're doing separate, you will also need to know the balanced symbol equation, uh, which in this case it will be six carbon dioxide, so six CO2 plus six H2O make c 6 h 12 6 and 6 2 So make sure you recognize and remember this one. So the question is, how can we turn carbon dioxide as a gas and reacting it with water, liquid, and somehow turn into glucose and oxygen? And then we need to then actually think about what is the uh, what are some of the adaptations of the plant? How can the plant actually do this? So first of all, here we've got a plant. So specifically, photosynthesis uh, is a chemical reaction that uses light energy to do that reaction there. So it's actually about the leaves. In the leaves, they've got a cell called palisade mesophyll cell. They have lots and lots of chloroplast in them. Chloroplasts are uh, organelles within the palisade mesophyll cells. Now, a lot of plant cells do have them, but there is particularly lots of them. Uh, within these particular cells, and that's the adaptation. And inside these chloroplasts, they contain a green pigment called chlorophyll. And these chlorophyll pigments are able to absorb the light and then convert that energy from the light to do that reaction. So they absorb the light for photosynthesis. That's the initial bit about using the light as a way to start this reaction. But we still need to think about the two reactants. So in the leaves, apart from having palisade mesophyll cells, on the lower epidermis, we also got this structure. Now here we've got the two guard cells on the side, but actually we've got uh, the main thing is the hole inside, which is the stoma or the stomata. The stomata is what allows the carbon dioxide to actually enter the leaf. From the atmosphere, it goes through the stomata and then through the air spaces in the spongy mesophyll cells to get to the palisade mesophyll cells. On the other hand, we've got uh, the roots, uh, which is underneath the ground on, in the soil, and that's where the water is. So the water can then be absorbed through osmosis f uh, into the root hair cells and then through the xylem and the transpiration stream that then travels up uh, the stem in the xylem to the leaves and again doing the same thing, reacting, meeting the carbon dioxide there to do photosynthesis. So essentially, the carbon dioxide uh, it enters the plant through, by diffusion from the atmosphere through the stomata and the water gets absorbed by osmosis and that is through the roots or the root hair cells and then it's transported through the xylem from the soil. So these are the two reactants that we need for photosynthesis and together with the light energy absorbed by the chlorophyll in the chloroplast uh, then the reaction can occur. Now at this point it's worth mentioning that the photosynthesis reaction is an endothermic reaction. What we mean by that is that endo is means in, thermic refers to the thermal energy or heat. Uh, endothermic means it's absorbing heat. So photosynthesis is an endothermic reaction, meaning that it requires the, the cells need to absorb the heat energy from the surrounding area in order for the reaction to happen. So imagine if it's on a hot sunny day and you're standing next to a tree, you feel cooler, not just because you're in the shade, but also because the tree is actively absorbing your body heat for photosynthesis to occur. So that's one way to remember that photosynthesis is an endothermic reaction. So then we've got the two products that are then made, which is glucose and oxygen. So how can they be used? So first of all, glucose and oxygen can be both used in the same reaction 
which is aerobic respiration. You will learn aerobic respiration in a later chapter, uh, in fact it's the next one, and the whole reaction is the opposite of photosynthesis, where the glucose and oxygen react together to release energy and in the process um, also make carbon dioxide and water. The plants need energy anyways, uh, to, to same as in animals, you need them to grow, to build more molecules, etc. So they can be used up there. Some of the oxygen, of course, uh, that is not being used up will be released back into the atmosphere. And that's what kind of keep all the animals alive. And all of the oxygen that we have basically pretty much comes from the atmosphere, uh, comes from the plants doing photosynthesis uh, reaction. But glucose is the more interesting one, which is um, we need to know about how the plant actually use the glucose. So first of all, any excess glucose, apart from the ones that are being used in respiration, they can be converted into other molecules, uh, which forms part of the plant structure or storage. So first of all, it can be turned into starch, which is essentially a bunch of glucose being stuck together. It's a polysaccharide, what we call, as a complex carbohydrate. Uh, it can also be converted into lipids or fats, and both of these are useful as energy storage. So meaning if there is not enough light, um, so photosynthesis can't occur to make glucose for respiration, then the plant will be able to break down the starch and the lipids and uh, in, back into glucose and they can use it for respiration and energy. We can also find a lot of uh, starch in fruits uh, because that's essentially where they store the glucose for in order for the seeds inside the fruit to grow. Apart from these two, glucose can also be converted into cellulose, which is again a combination of glucose stuck together. And cellulose is used to make the cell wall. Without cellulose, there won't be any cell walls in the plant. So it forms an actual structure of the plants. And the final thing is that glucose can actually combine with nitrates in the soil. And in that process, they make uh, proteins. And proteins are very important because they literally form the main structure of all living things. But apart from that, in this case, we can also say that it can be turned into enzymes, which is essential in all chemical reactions. So photosynthesis requires enzymes as well, as well as the actual structure of the plant. So that is why um, some of you may have learned this in the plant diseases chapter. So if a plant is lacking in nitrates, they will have stunted growth because without nitrates, they that means glucose can't uh, be converted into proteins. Therefore, they can't make uh, form the actual structure of the plant. Therefore, the plant is essentially not growing. So stunted growth. So these are the five uses of glucose. So this is the whole chemical reaction of photosynthesis. And we talked about where the plant actually gets the re two reactants and how do they actually get transferred to the leaves. And we also talked about the uses of the products as well. So now we're going to look at some factors that affect for the photosynthetic rate. There are mainly three factors that you need to know. So I'm going to present them in three graphs. So first of all, it's worth noting that the y axis is always about the rate of reaction, or in this case, the rate of photosynthesis. So there are three things. First of all, we can look at light intensity. Since photosynthesis requires light to happen, obviously, the, the, how much light it, the plant receives will affect the rate. We're also going to talk about carbon dioxide concentration, because that is one of the main reactants of the whole photosynthesis reaction. So obviously, it's going to affect it. We don't talk about water. Uh, availability so much because actually um, before water can be used in photosynthesis it's used in uh, uh, retaining the turgidity of cells and keep giving the cell structure so we don't talk about water availability affecting photosynthesis then finally the last one is the effects of temperature so let's look at light intensity first in the beginning, obviously, if there's no light, then photosynthesis will not happen. As we have more light, then the rate of photosynthesis increases because obviously the more light you get, the more energy you have, then the more uh, reaction can occur. But eventually it's going to plateau and stay the same. Now, if we look at the, the graph for carbon dioxide concentration, it's pretty much the same. As the carbon dioxide concentration increases, then so does the rate of photosynthesis, but eventually it's going to also flatten and plateau once it reaches a certain point. Now, the, the reason for these two is because there's something called limiting factors. So limiting factors are anything that prevents the further increase 
of the rate of reaction. So essentially, it's something else that's stopping it from going any further. So it doesn't matter if you give, for example, more light to the plant because it's running low on the reactants. For example, it can't keep doing that reaction. So in the case of the first graph, in the case with light intensity, once we reach to this point, the limiting factors would be the other two factors, the carbon dioxide concentration and temperature. If I increase the concentration of carbon dioxide, then perhaps the rate can go even further. Or if the temperature reaches, um, it's getting higher, then maybe perhaps the reaction can happen faster again. So those other two factors become limiting. Whereas graph in the middle with carbon dioxide concentration, um, the limiting factor is the other two. So in this case, it would be the light intensity um, and temperature. So perhaps if I, once I get to this point, if I increase the light intensity, then the rate of reaction can go even higher. So that's nice and easy. It's always the other two that becomes limiting. However, in the case of uh, temperature, the graph looks slightly different. So in the beginning, when it's very cold, then obviously the rate of reaction will also be very cold. As it heats up, because molecules gain kinetic energy, they start vibrating more, they collide more with the enzymes, and therefore the rate of reaction goes high. However, once it passes a certain point, the rate of photosynthesis crashes down, like so. Now, some of you might recognize the shape of this graph, and it literally is the same as uh, the graph for enzyme activity and the effects of temperature on that particular case. Because keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, photosynthesis is a chemical reaction that is controlled by enzymes. So therefore, in this case, what's happening is that the enzymes are inactive when it's very cold because there's no low kinetic energy, so particles are not vibrating much or not moving much, there's not much co successful collision. Then we reach what we call an optimum temperature where all of the enzymes are working, but very quickly as we go further on, the enzymes start to denature. And because the enzymes have denatured, the chemical reaction can no longer happen, the rate of photosynthesis drops down to zero. So in this case, uh, we only talk about limiting factor at the optimal temperature when it's got the highest possible photosynthetic rate. So at this point, uh, then we can say the carbon dioxide concentration and light intensity become limiting factors. But in the case of exam questions, they tend to ask you more to explain why would the rate drop, which is linking back to enzyme uh, denaturation. So those are the three factors that affect photosynthetic rate. So now we go to the concept of greenhouses. Now that we know what the what are some of the environmental factors that uh, could affect the rate of photosynthesis, farmers can then design a greenhouse to control those limiting factors. And by doing so, you can maximize the rate of photosynthesis, which means you're maximizing crop yield. And the word crop yield is probably going to become very important in this part because it just it simply means how much how much crops or how many crops or how many uh, plants you can actually get to sell it. And the concept of greenhouses it, and farmers, it's about the cost. So it's not just about the science of photosynthesis or how do we affect the rate of it. It's about money. It's about financially speaking, how can we minimize our cost but maximize uh, our crop yield. So there are a few things that you can uh, consider. I'm just going to talk about the overview of it here. So uh, one way is to think about this is that they've got glass walls or glass ceilings. You're keeping the warmth in, so you're trapping the heat inside, uh, keeping the temperature relatively high, but as, at the same time, allow the light to go through because it's transparent. So it's about, um, again, maximizing the amount of light you can have, naturally speaking, and also the heat as well. You might want to also make sure the plants are still doing photosynthesis at nighttime. So you might want to consider using artificial light, but you have to consider the amount of heat that the light can give out and also the cost that um, you will need to uh, keep the lights running at night. So those are some of the things you will need to consider. So you might think about what type of lights, uh, light bulbs that you might want to use. Uh, is um, For example, LED light does not give out heat, even though it gives out light um, or how do you minimize, as I said, energy losses through heating or through uh, using electricity? You might want to also have certain computer systems and sensors to monitor the conditions inside and be connected to the light or perhaps the sprinklers. If it's getting too hot or if it's getting too dry, then they would automatically start uh, the sprinklers to uh, you know, obviously give out water to provide water to the plants and also to cool down the plants as well. 
Another one is uh, that I have seen before is use of paraffin lamps. So these are lamps that can give out carbon dioxide because they're burning, but also, also uh, controls the temperature. So kind of linking to the concept of um, controlling all of the factors, uh, that would be one way to do uh, to basically uh, regulate two factors with one particular equipment. Uh, the newer ones might have thermostats in them as well. Uh, connecting to heaters or sprinklers, as I said, about the computer system, again, is about controlling those factors to maximize uh, the yield and the rate of reaction. Fundamentally, with greenhouses, um, in terms of exam questions, lots of students probably will be able to say how they could maximize the photosynthetic yield using these particular methods mentioned. However, the exam question will probably phrase it as, how do you maximize the, um, the profit that farmers can make through using a greenhouse. So your answer must link to the cost that is needed to maintain the conditions in the greenhouse and then comparing it to the profit that could be gained from having a high crop yield. The key thing is be careful when reading the question. Is it asking you how do you maximize the rate of photosynthesis or how do you maximize crop yield or is the question asking about um, how much money the farmers can make or if they can make profit from it? Then you, if that's the case, make sure you mention the cost instead of just simply talking about conditions. So there you have it. That is the overview of photosynthesis. Um, there is one thing that I didn't quite mention, which is the required practical in terms of investigating factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. Uh, but basically, it's all about the limiting factors, as mentioned uh, on the bottom left hand corner here. One thing to be careful about as well is um, there is a misconception, a very common one, uh, where people think that plants can only do photosynthesis. Um, really important to remember that plants are living things so that means they must also be doing respiration at all times so in terms of questions about rate of reaction or glucose yield or oxygen uh, release be aware that during the daytime there will be a excess of oxygen being released because the plants are doing photosynthesis and respiration at the same time but because of the light that means and there will be excess oxygen being made and released however at night time Yes, photosynthesis is not occurring. However, respiration continues to occur. So therefore, during nighttime, you will have a decrease in the oxygen levels because it's actively taking the oxygen that from the atmosphere in order to release energy. So one key common misconception to make sure you don't make is that plants do photosynthesis and respiration at the same time. So this reaction that we have shown is happening both ways during the daytime, something to keep in mind of when it comes to exam questions. <laughs>